we're going to talk about something that's that I haven't actually covered in detail for, I don't know, maybe four years. Um, I want to talk about angels. Ooh. Um, yeah, angels and the role they play in our lives. Because again, we, we often just find ourselves addressing topics that, that, that are so uh, misunderstood and misrepresented. We really want to, you know, and, and also take things to another level of deeper understanding. So, you know, we're not going to talk cosmically about angels, something, about these things that are out of touch, out of reach. That's not at all what I'm about. I love the applicable. So we're going to talk about angels, but we have to understand, I mean, the, the word angel, uh, you know, in Latin, messenger. Archangel in Greek is the, you know, the lead, the, the head angels or lead angels. But uh, angels are not like just beings or people. They are thoughts of God. They are thoughts, of, like imagine that God's just, it is just as a metaphor, but imagine God's children, us. We come all into the earth plane and we get trapped and confused and so forth. But God also then sends a blessing, a thought of helpers. And those things seemingly get embodied in something we call angels. But imagine that they're, they're, they're messengers, but they're not just like another race. Technically, they're creations of God just like us. In that sense, we're equal to them. But the angels have not chosen to believe in separation. So they're just clearer. They're choosing to be clearer. We could choose to be clearer. And it's possible for angels to choose not to be clear. But generally speaking, an angel by definition is one that is chosen to remain clear. And you know, on, on, on planet Earth, there's so many things that we mess up. We, we actually think of angels as being, you know, these like humanized. And instead we should spiritualize humans rather than humanize spirits. We need to become more like angels, not just talk to them. I mean, what's the whole point? Guess what? Archangel Michael comes to me all the time. It's amazing. Yeah, but you still act rude. So how is that telling me? Any? I'm not even interested. You can have Gabriel come to you, Archangel. You could have, oh my God, a cavalcade of angels coming through your living room for your annual ball. You know, they could all dance with you. I, I personally am not interested if you're still rude. I want to know how it's changed you. That's all. Because you can have the most humble person have a near-death experience, a most disturbed, rude, mean person, cruel person, have a near-death experience, see a spiritual presence, and change their lives. Then you have people that might have spiritual experiences and not be so humble, and they change nothing. But they sometimes think they're amazing. They're special. They write books. They're the you know, angelic messenger of earth, or they're the channel of whatever being it might be. And yet there's nothing changing about them. I like the other person more than I prefer this person. I remember, you know, in the 90s especially, channeling was quite popular, you know, and I always said to people, go to God. The angels are messengers. Don't go to the messengers. Go to God, and God will choose which messenger you'll receive. But don't just go to, you know, that's, why not just go to UPS and ask them for spiritual guidance? They're just messengers. I understand. I'm not, I'm not saying angels aren't high consciousness. I'm saying be advised that you actually tempt even angels to fall when you make them into gods. Because the angels are telling you, any angel worth, worth their salt, so to speak, any angel worth anything of value will tell you, and they have done this to some beings in history. Do not pray to us. Pray to God. And still, the Book of Enoch talks about that. Enoch encounters these fallen angels. And they're like, Enoch, please pray for us. Help us. He's like, why are you in darkness? You're angels. You're supposed to be helping us, not asking us to help you. Yeah, well, there's a thing about that, these angels say. Yeah, about that. Uh, well... We're some of the angels that visited earth when mankind first came here. And we found that the earthlings were so enthralled by our power, we made them start worshiping us. And now we live in darkness. Not all angels, it's one particular group. That's an important lesson to remember. 
You can even tempt angels to fall by worshiping them. And the same goes for spiritual teachers. I believe that we have a certain responsibility to have integrity and live to a, a certain standard. It shouldn't be what people tell you to or what their fantasies would try to force you into. And you shouldn't be doing it for them. You should just live a higher life anyway if you're in a role as a spiritual teacher. But the same is true for any person of representation, like a parent. You know, a parent should try to have it together a little more than their children. <laughs> you know, like a little. Come on, just a little? You know, when your child has more wisdom than you, there's a problem, especially if they're like three. <laughs> you know? <laughs> anyway, the knowledge and understanding about angels is old. I mean, this is ancient Babylonia, ancient Samaria. This is old. The concept of angels is very old. The Essenes practice their communions with angels. If you don't know who the Essenes are, they're, uh, a very, they're the New Agers, the Gnostics and New Agers of the time of Christ and before, you know. They were existing hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. Uh, just a, a retreat, you know, an aesthetic group of spiritual people. Kind of like Finhorn on steroids. Because the Essenes took not just one place, like Finhorn is a little uninhabitable to a degree, their area of Scotland on the coast. But they took that and made it a thriving garden, the people at Findhorn. And um, the Essenes live in a completely inhospitable area, the Dead Sea region, in the Jordan region, in the Middle East. And uh, it's amazing. I mean, the, the water in the Dead Sea, nothing lives in there because it's so salted. It's, nothing can live in there. So it's not like Dead Sea, like they have an ocean or a, a, a bay or a, a, a lake or nothing. There's nothing out there but rock and desert. There's desert, that's it. And they had a thriving community. Why? They would tell you, we commune with God and God's angels. See, but they're not worshiping the angels. They're living in communion, communion with them. They would worship and, and, you know, God and, you know, day and night. Everything they would do would be sanctified to God. When you joined the Essene community, you took vows of silence, sometimes for years before they would accept you in the community. It's kind of amazing. You had to show your, your sincerity, your commitment. Anything that came in financially was everybody's. Oh, well, that's mine. You're gone. If you can't think like a we, you can't be part of a community that can be such a, in a high level of consciousness. So the Essenes were just amazing. But they had morning, you know, midday and evening rituals that they would do, communing with the angels. Again, not to worship with them, but thinking of them almost like as helpers. So they would, they would, they would um, do communion with, you know, connecting with the angel of joy, the angel of light, the angel of power, the angel of life, the angel of work. But to them, angels were not wing-flapping beings. They were forces. And this is important because when Edgar Cayce would talk to you about your body, your health, and doing his readings in years gone by, he would use words like, instead of your blood, he would say circulatory forces. Because we forgot everything has an energy to it, a life force to it. Don't think separate. He would even tell you if you needed surgery, he would say surgical forces. Humans think good, bad. Surgeries are bad. It's not holistic. Something else is good because it's herbal. Everything, including a surgery, has an energy, a force to it. Even the metals in the instruments, there's energy and forces to it. There's life force in minerals, and there's life force in elements, which is why we call we, they're elementals. We've talked about elementals and nature, nature spirits in one talk here. Okay, so those are they're forces. They're, you can embody them. You could. You wouldn't be wrong to imagine them being characters. You know, uh, embodied characters. But you would be wrong to think that they're only that. They're forces. You're working. You're you're working with. Like when you get in water, you're moving through the water. You know, if you think it, it's just some linear thing, you kind of lose the experience. When you dance, where are you dancing? I'm I'm dancing right here. And wh what are you doing? And I'm well, I'm moving and dancing without remembering that as I move, there's air that moves with me. I'm, I'm changing. I'm, I'm doing something. I'm stirring the ethers when I start my movement dance. 
I'm stirring the ethers, the whole universe, the Taoism would say. A, a butterfly can flap a wing on one side of the planet and it'll be involved in contributing to a hurricane on the other side of the planet. There is no separation in quantum physics, the quantum ideas. One wave of God, one uni verse means one song, one verse. The energy of God. The manifested one is the is starting to degrade into separation. The unmanifest, unseen universe, the closest we would know it is quantum waves. But that wave through the universe, anything, and they know this scientifically, that if a particle or a wave of, of quantum is affected over here, it's going to affect it all the way through the universe. No thing happens without affecting the all. Like you said, 16 years can go by and still be affected by one session or conversation. One loving thought. We have no idea. And you don't want to know. It's so complicated, but yet simple, mind you. But it's so complicated, a human mind can't understand our effect in our lives. In fact, our lives are only our lives because we affected them. And when we struggle, I as an individual and we as a collective, any of us individually and we as a collective, we're constantly creating our universe and our reality as it's so often called. The angels are there to try to help remind us of an alternative reality. One where there's only love. And just to even have a taste of that is incredible. There's nothing wrong with people seeing angels and, you know, but let me tell you, first of all, they're not always white and they're not always blonde and they're not always female. Just FYI, in case that, you know, you need to run screaming from the building, um, get that out of the way now if that disturbs your reality in any way. They, they don't have blonde hair. They don't have hair. They have halos. They're not white skinned. They don't have skin, but they glow. They take any form at all so that you don't freak out. So that it feels like they're familiar to you. But they don't actually have form. But there's something energetically that your head will interpret. You're seeing a being, but it's just pure light. So sometimes that's what people have said. It's just this light, right? Okay. Does that mean it wasn't an angel because it didn't sprout wings for you? No. This, that's what they generally would look like. The most brilliant, beautiful light. But so that you can identify with it, it takes a bit of a form. More often female than male. Why? Female may be less intimidating. May, more naturally like a nurturer. And there's often this, you know, what, hair, blonde hair. Most, there's no blonde hair. But they have a, a, a halo. And your mind makes yourself think that it's hair, golden hair. It's not golden hair, it's a halo. And then, oh, and they show up, of course, ring, ring, you know, playing harp. They don't play harps. They don't, you know, you know, drummer angels, you know, oh, they're always the raucous ones. No, you know, the angels don't play instruments, but they emanate a vibration that creates sound. So people's heads had to have imagined that they come in playing instruments because that's what your head thinks it needs. And they don't actually have wings. You think they need wings to get from one place to another, so you give them wings. Because ancient times, people would think well, there's only one way to get from one place to another, in fast kind of a route, flying. Oh, angels then have wings. And they're like, fine, you know. <laughs> whatever. Um, but they don't have wings. But that thing that looks like there's wings sprouting off the sides of them, these glorious, white, shiny wings, that's just how bright their energy is. You're really seeing light interpreted, downgraded in a sense, but interpreted to a human mind. And I'm not saying that's bad, not at all. If you see an angel and has wings, just give thanks you're seeing an angel. Don't worry that there's wings or not. Just enjoy and, and absorb that concept. But Angels are pure light and they're messengers from God. One of their roles is to be a bridge between the seen and unseen. They're helpers. Not just messengers, because that implies they give you a message and they go. There are messenger angels, but there are helping angels too. Everyone has at least one guardian angel. Some of us need more. 
But, you know, everybody's got, you know, some people are like, I got five. You know, as though that's better. I got, how many, you know, like you go around new age parties, hey man. How many, how many angels you got? Uh, only one. Yeah, I'm a seven angel guy. You know what you should say to them? You shouldn't have to have that many, man. What's wrong with you? Anyway, all right. So I'm going to share a couple of quotes from A Course in Miracles on angels. Angels light the way so that all darkness vanishes and you're standing in a light so bright and clear you can understand all things you see. Another, you do not walk alone. God's angels hover near and all about. His love surrounds you. See, his, God's love surrounds you. And in this, it's making the context that the angels are his love. And of this be sure, I will never leave you comfortless. Another, angels are extensions of God's thoughts, symbols of the light and protection of God that always surrounds us. And one more, say God, say God's name, and you will immediately invite angels to surround the ground on which you stand and sing to you as they spread out their wings to keep you safe and shelter you from every worldly thought that would intrude upon your holiness. The wings are the metaphor, but their love would surround you. There's a story that I always share when I talk about angels, and I think it's one of the most um, um, just amazing stories ever recorded, really, in modern times for sure. But there was this one time where um, somebody who was unstable mentally um, broke into a school and um, took, you know, the children, like a kindergarten class, hostage, and wouldn't let anybody in and had a bunch of explosives strapped to himself. And so he was, gonna, he was saying he's going to you know, blow the room and all the kids were in there and they're all going to clearly die. Um, so he goes into this room. They can't rush the room. I mean, they can't. So, so you, your, your SWAT teams and stuff, they can't rush the room because if, if this happens, they're going to be responsible. At least not rushing the room, there's a 50-50 chance, presumably. But he's going to blow the room. Now, what ends up happening, long story short, is they can't get into the room and so forth. There's just this one classroom. It's a class of, you know, 30 or so uh, kindergarten kids. The guy ends up blowing the room, wiping out the entire room. But in the room, one little spot was not charred. One spot where the kids all huddled together. And when the police, you know, and the firemen, they all come in and, like, well, you know, get everything, you know, and the guy's gone, everything's gone, the room's completely blasted. And they're saying, so what happened? And he said, they said, the kids said, we saw angels, and they told us to uh, uh, cluster together, and they wrapped themselves over us to protect us. Yeah. Now, you know, of course, you know, you have authorities going, oh, poor kids, they must have been, the stress probably caused them to imagine things. That's how this world deals with spiritual things. Like it's always a hallucination or something. The world that isn't miraculous is the hallucination. Seriously, that's the one that's messed up and disturbed, honestly. That's the one we're, you know, imagining negatively into place. It takes work to not see angels. It takes effort to not have constant miracles, to not feel the presence of God. It actually takes work. Jesus says, that's why you have to sleep at night, because you're exhausted from being an ego. I paraphrased it slightly, but that's what he says. It's, that's basically what he says. You're exhausted from constantly having to keep alive your false world. It takes effort. Which tells me if it takes work to keep a false world, it would be effortless to allow a real world. And that's true, but then why doesn't it happen? There's a reason, which is fear. People are more afraid of their light than darkness. People are more afraid of God than separation. Why? Not because that's sane. That makes no sense at all. But people have fallen into a hypnotic trance, a negative hypnotic trance. We asked what life would be like without God, and this is what it would be like to be without God. We asked, and so it is. Now we have to get over ourselves. We chose to ask what it would be like, and it's manifested. Now, we as creators tend to, you know, creators tend to believe in their creations. So we believe in our creation, and so it seems to be solid. If God were to come and strip away our creations, we would go mad permanently. Because we believe in our creations. You're supposed to believe in your creations. 
The only thing is this is not a creation. It's a manufactured reality. It's not a creation. A creation is always love-based. A manufactured reality is anything but love. So all we have to do is realize we were just having a daydream, a nightmare, and it would start to disappear. Angels in their infinite patience as thoughts of God, messengers of God, guardians and so on, they're here to kind of help hold space like a midwife. Angels are like midwives. They're holding space <coughs> while we birth the Christ self. It's just that it happened to take a lot more than nine months. Nine lifetimes. How about 900 lifetimes? It doesn't matter if it's your first lifetime on earth or your 9,000th lifetime. There's not even one thought in any angel that surrounds you about that. They hold space like it's perfectly the, the same minute that when they started. Just perfectly holding space. Absolute, unconditional love. You know, don't get caught up in, well, I, I can't see angels. Someone else isn't better than you. You never know. Believe it or not, the ability to see angels can come from spiritual development. You go, oh, that's what I want. But, but it can also come from being heavily damaged. Believe it or not, you could have just done so many drugs that you screwed up your, your brain cells and your etheric double that's supposed to protect your body's health. You could have damaged it so much that beings are, you're more susceptible to seeing things. But they're not always nice things either. You could have had child abuse and it taught you to dissociate from your human self, grounding, and so you're more capable of seeing things out there. That's not necessarily a compliment. It still came from wounding. Your job is not just to see things. You can do drugs and do that. Your job is to be healthy. Mind, body, and soul. So if something I've done has opened up my etheric field to where I can see beings, good for me. That's nice. But I still need to heal. And your ego is going to say, if you heal, you're not going to see beings anymore. You say, I'm going to do it anyway. Because your wholeness is more important than phenomena. You know, just cool things that you see sparkles and colors and whatever. I know it sounds cool. Do not tempt the Lord thy God, which is you. Do not be tempted by mundane things. But if you see things, great. If it's coming from unhealthy causations, then maybe work on those causations so you can be healthy and potentially see. When Jesus tells you in A Course in Miracles, there's a workbook lesson that's going to change your vision. You're going to start seeing auras potentially. You'll start seeing things. He's not telling you that you must see them. He's just saying as you do work on your mind and changing your consciousness, it's common to see things. But it is not your goal. It's just a side effect. Don't worry about it. You're going to go to a dentist, get Novocaine. Your goal is not Novocaine or to be numb. That's just the side effect of that. You don't get all caught up on that. That's not why you're there. You're also not trying to be spiritual just to see cool things. You're supposed to be consciously, you know, just changing your consciousness, becoming a different, I have to say, better person. So if you don't see them, they're not not there. They're there. Angels can't not be there. You can't not have an aura, an energy field. You have energy systems. You might not see your lung meridian, but it's there. Don't say, well, if, I, if only I could see my, my meridians, I would be more spiritual. Just be nice. Just be nice. Just be a nicer and nicer person. You become so nice, here's what happens. There's a saying that can be interpreted in so many beautiful ways. And one way is, let your home be a place that angels would seek to dwell. And what that means is me. Let you yourself become a place that angels would seek to dwell. Because you have angels within and you have angels without. Angels actually exist inside as well. There's no time-space thing as we know it on the human level. But commonly, artists and poets have been known to have communion with angels. Sensitive souls. You know, that's beautiful. Let them tell you. If you want to know about them, let them tell you in their poems. Let them tell you in their paintings. If you want to see or feel like from that level what it's like, what angels are like but mostly become what you think angels are. Become benevolent. Bring messages from God today. Don't preach them. Bring them. Be them. And there's a great story. Uh, you know, William Blake, who was a, an amazing mystic, he says that when he was little, Jesus and angels taught him how to paint and draw. Jeez, like what school was that? Like, serious? 
You know, I still just doodle. There's a head and a stick man, and he's just all these cosmic things that he says angels taught him. Raphael, the great artist, he said, angels taught me. That's just so cool. As children, these people saw things. Edgar Cayce was told by an angel, we want you to know that God has heard your prayers to want to help people, Edgar, little Edgar, and your, your prayers have been answered. You're going to do something wonderful. This angel, this glorious, shiny, golden angel tells him, children so often are seeing these things and people don't believe it or know it. You know, they don't often say it, sometimes because it's so common to them. When I had uh, one child, I think she was around one, and, um, you know, uh, she's probably around 35 now, but when she was one, her, her sister, I, we were pregnant with a second daughter, and um, when the second child was, you know, coming or whatever, you know, in the, in the tummy, um, the first child was playing with her little toy phone, you know, and that's okay, that's, you know, ring, ring, you know, it play, but she's talking, having conversations, and I'm like, hey, honey, what you talking to? The angels. Oh, really? What are they saying? Lottery numbers? No. Um, <laughs> what are they saying? Oh, they said another baby's coming. Well, nobody knew that at this point. Really? Another baby, huh? And um, is it going to be a boy or a girl? She's on the phone. You know, is it going to be a boy or a girl? She said, it hasn't been decided yet. It's spinning around in the clouds. I'm like, jeez. You know. It's, it's, it's receptive people. But you could be a, a really messed up person in a receptive moment. You know, don't think perfect people see God. Or angels or whatever. It's just the tumblers fall into place. It's nothing personal when it hasn't happened for you. And even when it has, you doubt it. Any parent could have had my experience and went, oh, don't be silly. That's what they often do. Oh, she's just you know, playing and you know, she's just talking on the phone, making something up. That's what they do. And it doesn't help build the connection, the lines of communication with angels. Um, Raphael, though, was painting his frescoes, famous frescoes and so forth, angels all in them and so forth. And there's these uh, couple of cardinals that came into the place to, to see what he's painting, you know. And they're looking and admiring and kind of, huh, look at, you know, and Raphael's just painting away. And one of them says, Raphael, why do you always paint, seem to paint your angels with red faces? Now, Raphael doesn't even pause. He just continues, Hey, Raphael, why do you paint faces, uh, red faces on your angels? He says, that's because of the rage they feel for what the church, the hands the church has fallen into. <laughs> like, you know, you just want to go, okay, let's leave, you know, like, seriously, it, especially at such a time. They're, 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 they're embarrassed and enraged at the hands with which the church has fallen. It's, and you're talking to cardinals, you know, that doesn't go over well. But he never even flinched. He just paints away. Because he knew. There's, you know, they, one time, great artist, I don't remember which one, um, didn't, you know, the, 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 the cardinals and whatever visiting his, his painting, and they said, your paintings are ridiculous. You're putting sandals on angels. Angels don't have, wear sandals. And he goes, yeah, they also don't have feet. <laughs> you know, like, that's the brilliance of an artist arguing with somebody who thinks they're intelligent. You know, you, they don't have feet either, man. Come on. We got, we're painting something that's a depiction. It's for people to be able to connect with something. So we look into our lives and realize there's so much. I've said this many times, especially recently. There are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in all your philosophies. You know, angels and what they mean and what they do for us. And... People have forgotten this, but, but don't just get caught up in angels. Remember, this is how much love God has. It's like the angels are the arms of God coming to hold us. Don't make it just about things or beings. It's the arms of God coming to us. How do they communicate? Uh, synchronicities, inspirations, whispers. 
you know, I, I, I do talks and I'm really grateful because sometimes real sensitive people are, sometimes people that have never had spiritual experiences, swear, swear to you, have come and, and watched online or attended in person and said, I saw an angel standing next to you. I saw an angel behind you. Michael, I saw, and, and Mother Mary, I mean, all kinds of beautiful things. Not once in all my years of teaching, which is almost 40 years, not once have I ever turned to ask them for their name. People will say, I saw Mother Mary, I saw an angel, I saw the, and they'll say to me, what angel was it that was working with you? No. I don't allow myself to be tempted to, to get involved on that level. If Archangel Michael says something, I, I might say, it's telling me to tell you, fine. But I don't get all identifying oriented. I don't get into all that. To me, God first, and anybody that wants to show up is welcome. Archangels, guardian angels, ascending angels, this angel, you know, whatever kinds of it, they're all welcome. But I don't get caught up in it, and I know why. And I try to tactfully convey to others. There's a very popular teacher on the topic of angels, which I will not name their name. And if you're online, don't post their name. You don't need to, okay? And that stuff's not necessary. Some people go, oh, I know who he's talking about. Don't, don't name names. We don't need to. But there's a very popular teacher on the topic of angels. And the person has, has made a couple of, of mistakes in the sense that unhealed wounds, now they were really in touch with angels, talking angels, get everybody getting everybody excited about angels. But some unhealed trauma was there um, that's now backing up on the person. But also overly deifying the angels, overly making them the power and the credit. Now the person is having what could be, I won't say for sure, could be described as a nervous breakdown. So they've completely backed off and not only not teaching about angels anymore, but saying to the world, and lots of people are listening because there's been no person uh, of this person's gender that has had more influence on the new age kind of teachings and community. And they're now saying, those angels are all demons. They tricked me. And get away from angels, get away from cool stuff and angel, new age stuff and just, you know, become fundamental Christian. Um, you know, it is. It's, 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 a, it's a nervous breakdown. You can tell because of the intensity, the fear, the reaction, and, and calling angels demons in disguise. You know, it's just strange. But I don't worry about it too much personally because I never, you know, uh, bit the apple and bought into the whole... Exciting, exciting aspect of what they were putting out there, nor do I need to swing to the opposite extreme and do the opposite. Right here, I know. You think, then you don't think. I know. And that's all we have to do is sit in the I know. I know angels to be the arms of God. I know angels to be messengers of love. Just sit in that. When you, when you find yourself overreacting to something, an overreaction means there was already an action before that. I swung too far right, now I'm swinging too far left. You know, there's some Twilight Zone episodes made on things like that, you know. You're overly Republican, you're coming back as a Democrat, man. You're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> and vice versa. You know, please, I mean, understand, it's never politics I'm talking about. I'm talking about human nature. Become exceedingly invested in one thing and a lesson's going to come to you to help you balance it. That's the nature of this world. Um, the Twilight Zone, you might remember. The, um, there's an episode where it's the Second World War and there's a soldier, he's in command of his troops and you know he was just passionate about killing the enemy. I mean, intensely passionate. Kill them. Kill them till there's no more. Kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them. You know? And all of a sudden, as Twilight Zone often did, he becomes that other race. And he's on the other side. Kill him, kill him. And he's, you know, he's having to deal with the terror that his men are all that other race that he doesn't like. And it's, he's catching on. This has to be a nightmare. What's going on here? And at the end of the day, you know, kill and be killed. Hate and you'll be hated. Judge and you shall be judged. Everything that swings one way is going to swing to an opposite. All movement's going to have an equal reaction. Unless... You're centered, and that's our job. There are commonly nine, three groups of three, nine groups of angels in what's you know, considered the traditional 
um, hierarchy, if you want to call it that. And um, I love th that this is a little different. Origin of Alexandria, a, a master of the time, ancient Alexandria, he actually said that, that souls shot away from God in three groups. They splintered into three groups. Those who fell the lowest became what we call demonic, but they're still part of us. They're still part of the beings. We call them something, but they just fell further. Then there's the humans, and the angels were the highest that didn't fall as much. That's one belief, and I totally agree with that. Three groups. It's something I've taught you know, all my years. Three groups. But the one group of angels up here at the top, they chose not to believe in the separation. Humans are in the middle kind of back and forth on this. You know, we're trying to not believe in the... And then there's the, the lower kingdom where there's just really hate and a conviction towards separation. But they're still us. They're not worse. They're not better. They're just beings that are making that belief or that choice. But the ones that remained at the top, those are the angelic kingdom. And they splinter off into three groups. But in those three groups, you could essentially say that the, each of the three groups also overlap. So the highest of the first group is connected to the highest of the second group and the highest of the third group. Does that make sense? They kind of mirror each other. So the first are the seraphim, the cherubim, and the, uh, the thrones. Those are the three highest. Now I'm going to share a couple of Bible quotes uh, on this because to me it's kind of interesting. In Ephesians, you actually will hear these names and Colossians in the New Testament. You're going to hear references to angels by their group title that you don't even know are names of angels. So the names of angels don't just get manufactured or made up. The Catholics have actually have, uh, um, sort of secretly, you know, in a sense, the Vatican, um, they have a volume or volumes of uh, encyclopedia of angels. And I don't mean like the ones you buy in your local bookstore, to have like, you know, 50 or whatever. They have hundreds and sometimes, in some cases, thousands in their records of all the angels of light and the angels of darkness. And their priests are trained way more than people appreciate. You think that there's corruption in this or that church, and then you kind of lose love for them all. But there's also lovable things and admirable things in all the different groups and churches, believe it or not. And the Catholic, one thing is amazing, and that is they have to deal with exorcisms and things that are intense, where there's um, you know, just entities that are just so far gone that they're messing with people. But they have to go in, and they can, they can find ways to restrain those beings, there's techniques for that, but they restrain them and then ask them their name. When they get a name out of them, they check with the Vatican the name and the opposite reference to what angel is its opposite that can help fight that, that demon. So it's all very methodical beyond what people understand. But there's three groups. The seraphim, they're commonly or they often are called the burning ones. The seraphim are thought to, uh, to be ones of purification. These are the ones closest, the highest. Um, often when you see paintings of the highest angels, you're only going to see little cherub heads and wings on the sides of their heads. Now that doesn't mean they're just floating heads. It means they are only of consciousness. They're higher than an angel that's depicted with a body. Now even angels don't have bodies. It's an artist's way of saying their mind. They're just mind, they're consciousness. Little cherub heads with wings. Okay, so the cherubim, uh, 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 the, the seraphim at the top, then the cherub and, and the thrones. And the, you know, at the top, it's like we're at the, at the gates of heaven, surrounding God, just like they call them the thrones being one of them. They're all around, surrounding, these top three, surrounding the throne of God. They talk about these, these beings flapping their wings, And, and what it means, constantly flapping their wings in um, homage to God, in praise to God. Well, flapping their wings is not what they're doing. It means sending out vibrations of love. And those highest angels, seraphim, they're flapping their wings, sending out vibrations that basically filtered all the way through the universe, but every descending, if you have to call it that, group of angels has to take that energy and turn it into something more and more to manifested form. So it starts with, we're the thoughts of God, you know? So here's, here's like a, a, almost like a fan being turned on. Here's the flapping of the wings. We're going to take the air, God, and flap our wings and send that energy to you to be a light breeze for you. It's kind of like that. The light breeze can take the form of, a, of an angel, you know, speaking into your mind, speaking like whispering in your ear. 
So this group, the seraphim, they're called the primary choir of God. Then there's the cherubim. And the cherubim are um, sometimes attributed to being related to the guardians of the Garden of Eden. But there's a reason for that. Because the, the gates of heaven, where you have the seraphim and cherubim and thrones, the, the gates of heaven are right here. They're in front of it. It also makes sense that they're in front of guarding the gates of the Garden of Eden, because what is the Garden of Eden? Ultimately, the remembrance of God. There's also something to be said that there's an archangel in particular that guards the, the uh, gates of the Garden of Eden too, but that's you know, another story. But thrones... You know, the thrones is the third of the groups as, again, using lack of, uh, you know, better word, you know, divine. This is thrones. It's the, the lower of the top three groups. And the thrones symbolize uh, um, like divine power of God. It's, um, they call it judgment, but not meant in the form of judgment, but divine discernment. So this is where thoughts of God start having to sort of crystallize into discernments of what all the following angel or angelic groups are going to have to do. So it's about bringing goodness to the universe, and it's also about bringing divine protection, the thrones, the power of God. We move to the second group of three. There's three groups of three. Now the second group of three is the, where I'm going to share a quote, because the second group of three are dominions, virtues, and powers. Those are names of cl clusters of, of angels. Dominions, virtues, and powers. So listen to this quote from, the, from uh, the Bible. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Another quote from the Bible. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So again, dropping some of these names is my point. Dominions, you know, that's the, the highest form of this set. And the dominions are kind of like, it's time to start implementing divine work. They're into the manifested forces, even of nature. So the dominions are up taking care of universal laws, and some of the angels do the same, so I'll get to that. But this one's really about evolution of, of all things, mankind, nature, evolution. That's the dominions. The virtues are really about, that's the next group, manifesting miracles, miracles and grace. Miracles, and because miracles are an expression of grace. But grace isn't something you think it is. Grace isn't something bestowed because you were good enough. God gave us grace the day we thought we didn't have it. The day we thought we were flawed and could separate from God, God already said, no, can't be done. You're, you're holy. Well, we're going to go off and pretend we're not holy. Yeah, that's fine. But when you're ready, grace is already waiting for you. So it was, it's really who we are or what we are. When we receive grace, you're not receiving the grace from God per se. It's not getting bestowed, given to you like that. It's remembering who we are and our holiness. Then it feels like God gave you something, and it did, but it gave you your original identity. It's not a thing that really is seemingly correcting something like grace seems to be for most people. And the last group is powers. And that's the one that keeps the universe working. Laws of physics, even more mundane than the other group we talked about. This is, you know, the powers, the, the, the universal powers, the universal laws, physics, and so on. The third group of angels, you know, most of us know these, principalities, archangels, and angels. So the principalities, those guard nations. Just think of how we're descending here as we're talking, right? There's principalities, just like a principality would be an old term for a region. Principalities, those are angels that walk, uh, watch over um, nations and the decisions of nations, um, even humanitarian activities. Then you've got archangels. Archangels are commonly overseeing, uh, even though you would find it hard to believe, world leaders. <laughs> you know, archangels have several roles, and there's different archangels. And it's also all just thoughts of love of God. Let's remember that. But you've got uh, four primary archangels because of the four directions and the four lower centers. And then some would say there's another three so that there's one for each of our seven primary chakras or centers. You could say then that any chakra can be called upon, any angel, archangel can be called upon to empower one of your centers. You, but, but you don't want to totally fix a chakra to an archangel and think it has to be that way. 
you might be calling Raphael into your heart center if, and remember, it's not just the person, it's the principle you're calling in. You're calling in its, what it symbolizes, not just a person to do something for you. You call in strength, you don't just say, hey, I want an angel. It's, you know, like the Essenes did, angel of strength, angel of will, angel of work or whatever it happens to be. You're calling it into yourself. So, you know, archangels, they're, they're, um, Archangel Michael's supposed to be the, the lead of all the archangels, but Archangel Michael's, has, he has a unique role, and, and, and Raphael, and they all have a unique role, but Archangel Michael, one of his primary roles is when you're ready to awaken Christ consciousness, that's the role of Archangel Michael. All the angels really support us. There are special angels that come to us when you get on the spiritual path. Not because you're special and better than anybody not on the path, but you're going to need a unique level of support in that thing. Just like teachers or classes. Math 101, biology 101, and then you go to you know, another level of biology. There are levels of angels that come and support when you've gone to another level of consciousness. They sort of help, one group will help graduate you up, but another catches you and lifts you then higher, stabilizes you in your new consciousness. And Archangel Michael is all about Christ consciousness. He says in one channeling, um, G Christ is the way, because Jesus says, I am the way. That's why Druids, some of the original Druids, called themselves the, the way, the keepers of the way and guardians of the way, because the way is Christ consciousness. So the way is Christ, but, but Michael says, I'm the guardian of the way. So when a person says, I'm ready, I'm going to now awaken the highest consciousness a human being can awaken, Christ consciousness. Archangel Michael, okay, I've got a phone call coming, you know, can I help you? We've got a person awakening Christ. Got it. Got it. They come into your life. He comes into your consciousness and helps you awaken. It's not a he per se, and it's not a guy who goes to one at a time. This is consciousness. It can be in all places at once. But Archangel Michael supports you on, on that particular, you know, route. Raphael, most people know of Raphael as being an archangel related to healing. Um, Gabriel is, is the messenger. Like he's the one that's said to have given some of the messages to Mother Mary about her life, uh, pregnancy, and so on. Um, Uriel, though, is, is sometimes called Ariel, but Uriel is an interesting one. Um, they call Uriel the, the grand um, alchemist because he helps you transform misfortunes into fortunes. So... You can call upon Uriel as a consciousness, a power to support you through that time. But if you call on you know, a Hindu deity or a Mayan deity, it's okay. Go to God, and these things are going to happen anyway. If you go to God and say, I'm looking for some messages, God will help get you, Gabriel, and some other um, angels for that matter, to come to you. But some of us, it's not going to be angels and archangels. When, when God hears our prayers, like, I need some consoling, the right beings are being assigned to support you. But it's not always, I'm here, here, here. <laughs> Archangel Michael, Michael, you know, or Gabriel or whatever, to give you a message, message. It might just be, hi, honey, it's grandmother. <laughs> you know, that might be all you get because that's the one you'll believe in and listen to. Don't worry about who it is. Oh, oh, it's just Nana. Oh, I thought it's your grandma. You know. Oh, I was expecting maybe Archangel Michael. You know. You know what? Trust that if you go to God, the right synchronicity, the right message, the right, right whispering, the right everything, anything will come to you. Just trust in that. I never assign these things. And there are times, you know, in, in half in and out of sleep, man. You know, bizarre visions and things come to me. I, I never say, well, wait, I'm getting an inspiration for a new book, but I need to know who that's going to be. After all, I'm going to put you in the acknowledgments. You know, I never do that. Because if they're anything of reality, they're not going to mind. They're not going to say, well, fine, I'll never bring you another book title, you know, or whatever. There's none of that ego that needs to be dealt with or protected. Just go to God and know that these things come to you. Don't diss them if they do. If you feel a presence, I was struggling, I was upset, and then this calming presence came to me. That's the love angels of God. And it's kind of cool. There are beings that care. There are, we'll call them beings too, beings that care. And they're there to help you. 
It's not like you're distracting them. It's not like calling dad for a little bit of money for your rent. It's not like you're, he might have it, he might not. The angels can only say yes as long as what you're needing is helpful to you. If you're asking something that's hurtful to you, no. And that's why we learn to pray and say, I have forgotten what to ask for. I need guidance even on what to ask for. So your most loving humans that have passed on can actually become a guardian to you, believe it or not. Um, so when we get to, to, to these, the principalities, the archangels, and the angels, the angels also splinter off into a few groups. You have recording angels that are, believe, strange as it all may sound, you have angels that are helping you to accumulate all of your experiences, like your Akashic records. They're taking care of your files, of all of your thoughts, words, and deeds in this lifetime and all your lifetimes. It's, it sounds strange, but that's how it works. Because they're forces, they're consciousness, but you have beings that are taking care of your files, keeping them like your, you know, your own personal admin, taking care of all your files, keeping it all clear. Um, recording angels, but you also have, you know, guardian angels. Uh, we, we generally would know what that means, guardians, to protect you. And we have guiding angels, mostly the ones whispering, you know, hey, check this out, check that out. I've heard people talk about, I'm in the lane of a freeway, and all of a sudden, my car started steering itself off to the shoulder, and I couldn't stop it. It just steered over to the shoulder, couldn't stop it. And then a, a major accident happens right where they were parked a moment ago. You know, you have, you know, just amazing, beautiful forces taking care. And it doesn't mean you say, well, I guess I have an angel because I got steered off the road. Somebody else got hurt. They must not have them. Everybody's got them. Yours is saying, it's not your time. Somebody else is saying, hallelujah, man, come on through. There's not a failing. There's not a, you know, they have one and I don't. People sometimes think that when it comes to miracle working. Somebody had a miracle because uh, they lived in an accident, but the other people in the car died. No, that's not how it works. It means one of you lived to tell the tale, the others didn't live to tell the tale, but they're still alive. They still have angels and they still have miracles. Because they call it a miracle on the news that one survived. But that's because they can't interview the other people. That's a bit biased. Who would think the news could be biased? So remember, as we're closing and going to a moment of silence, please remember, go to God, guys. Why settle for anything else and anything less? You know, it's, it's fine. It's fine that your deceased loved ones are ringing your doorbell to let you know they're there. That's fine. Don't worship them. That's all I'm saying. Go to God in your prayers. Don't pray to something else. You can call upon the help of these things. Don't worship them. Call upon Call for courage. Ask the Holy Spirit, ask Jesus, ask Buddha, ask whatever you believe in, because they're all expressions of God. But one expression in the earth plane doesn't mean you deify it and worship it. It's, it's an expression. Why not honor where all the expressions come from? Don't worship a miracle. You know, that's kind of strange. Something wonderful happened today. I'm going to draw a picture of it, put it in my, you know, on my altar and bow to it. It's only a picture, and it's only a depiction of something that happened. What about the energy behind it, the intelligence, the love that sent you that miracle? Let's connect with that thing. Because if it's just a piece of paper, um, it, it's, first of all, it's dead. It's dense. It can burn. I don't want my gods to be able to just burn up, to dissipate, to rot and grow old. Look at what was behind it. And... Um, even if you're talking to spontaneously, they come to you, deceased loved ones, relatives, children, parents, or whatever they happen to be. Enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with it. Just don't worship them. That's an old superstitious way of life where a, a, a group of people, a civilization, something seemingly cool would have. A meteor could come and a rock comes and lands on a hillside and then they get it, put it in a box and worship it. That's like a message coming from a loved one. You're just worshiping that thing. Remember, I'm so grateful, Mother, I can hear you, and thank you for the feedback. Thank you is fine. And now when I'm done giving thanks to you, Mom, I'm giving praise and thanks to you, God, for allowing this to come through. Get back to God as often as possible. Okay? Let's take a few centering breaths.
Setting aside all the stuff of the world. How can I make myself a place that angels would seek to dwell? We know of and believe in the holy messengers of God. We give thanks in advance that God, Spirit, Source loves us so perfectly, so brilliantly, that it's impossible for it to not send to us constantly angels of love in numerous forms. We give thanks that there's a purpose to it all. That even in the three-dimensional world, God sends its thoughts of love to harmonize everything, to keep everything steady, to bring new healthiness to us and keep unhealthiness at bay, at check, in check. In this moment, we choose to surrender all doubts and fears that come with distancing ourselves from God's messengers. We surrender all fears and such. Forgive us, Holy Spirit, Divine Mother of God, the one that determines what angels, messengers come to us and how and when. To you, we give up all our doubts and fears. We sincerely apologize for any need to keep such love at bay. We joyously open our hearts and welcome in your guidance in every form of love and light. We welcome in your messages in every form. In this moment, we open this space, any room that we happen to be in when we're watching this, we choose to allow this space to open up. And we have the right, given to us by God, to call in the presence of all of God's hierarchy of light, archangels, messengers of every form, powers, principalities, virtues, all such beings coming down into our being, descending into our hearts, our souls, into our consciousness, filling us. The virtues, which are the ones the middle of all the nine groups that bring to us miracles, to work miracles, to receive miracles. And in this moment, let's imagine opening our minds, sitting in a state of bliss, just floating feeling like we're just floating in a spiritual version of embryonic fluid, just floating. That we're connected to the ethers. A movement of one arm would move all the ethers to our right and the left would move the left. Everything connected. And 2,000 years ago, the angels heralded the great coming of Jesus as the Christ. But the angels are singing again at the birth of our own Christ consciousness. It's impossible for them to not sing because they're happy. And they're happy that we're choosing to awaken. So we just know that this is our intention to awaken our Christ selves. We know that this means Archangel Michael comes into our lives more intently and intensely. But the intensity only feels that way because our ego would want to resist it. 
divine Archangel Michael cutting away illusions, cutting away cords of unhealthiness and patterns and addictions and codependencies, just cutting them away and activating, turning the light switch on that activates the Christ self. I am as God created me. I will to be the Christ on earth. I am as God created me. And I choose nothing else. Because there is nothing else. And now quietly and spontaneously, imagine a portal in front of your third eye. Gently, like curtains, opens and reveals a messenger to you. An archangel, a deceased loved one, a guardian, a guide. Just feel something from it. If there's a look, note the look. If there's a feeling, note the feeling. An awareness, an understanding. Give that just a moment. and a message. If there is to be one, just let it come to mind. Gently. Don't analyze, don't force. Gently. It's going to be tempting for the, the human mind head to think and analyze, or even to doubt. Just allow it to be. The message. You'll know you're receiving the message if it is one of love, if it's uplifting, it's, if it's inspiring, if it's not, even if you're a channel of angels, it means you've lost it. You've spun off course and you've now become plagued by mischievous things. And you'll know because they'll tell you about fear, negativity. They'll make you feel off, undeserving. God's angels are reminders that you are not only deserving, you are the light. You are the love that you're seeking. In your own way, thank the messenger. Let the messenger fade away and look behind them to the pure light of God and in your own way thank God for your experience. And then gently and quietly gradually stretch out. Very nice. Nice job, guys. <laughs>